Hi everyone, I'm Rupert Vandervel and welcome back to the channel. As some viewers have probably realised, I'm much more of a pictures person than I am a sort of camera gear kind of person. Don't get me wrong, I love my cameras, but only because I like what they allow me to do. I'll use any camera that allows me to get the picture, but I'm far more interested in learning by looking at great pictures and what great photographers have produced. In a recent video, I talked about my top five favorite street photographers. You can find a link to the video in the description to this video below. So today I want to talk about five more photographers. And although they are renowned picture makers and their work is quite well known, you may not necessarily have heard of them. As our interest in photography grows and we expand our knowledge, with it comes the discovery and inspiration and sometimes quite obscure and unrelated places. For example, some time ago, I really got into the music of Philip Glass and Steve Reich, two composers closely associated with minimalism and repetition. Their discovery led me to other artists doing similar things, but in different mediums, such as painting and photography. Expanding your horizons in one direction can lead to other worlds opening up, but ones that might actually be linked to your initial area of interest, if that makes any sense. Anyway, this of course can happen when you're looking through books on photography. A single image can pique your interest and you dive in. So let's go ahead and dive into our first photographer that I think you should know. Paul Trevor is one of the great unsung heroes of British documentary photography. And his work is a great example of why you should always carry a camera. I first discovered his work whilst looking through a book entitled Photographer's London, a sort of history of England's capital city from a photographer's perspective between the years of 1839 and 1994. When reaching the images for the 1970s, this picture jumped out at me. Taken in Commercial Street in the East End of London in 1978, I just thought it was so beautiful. My response to it was almost an emotional one. It shows the terrible state of this part of London, which was once the heart of the Garment District, where you could hear the busy sewing machines all day and night from open windows. This is before the area succumbed to the building boom of the 1980s, when it was handed over to private developers and ultimately the property market. But this beautiful image, probably taken early in the morning under a white sky and with a mist hanging in the air, perfectly sums up the mood at the time. The hooded figure, perhaps on her way to work, walks steadily through the vehicle-less, deserted streets, shielded against the cold in her hooded coat, which, with its deep black, looks more like a cloak of some sort. I love the way the shape of her hood plays with the shapes of the tops of the street lamps, and the hint of something white peeking out from her bag provides a bit of contrast. It's a stunning picture. A book I can highly recommend is Once Upon a Time in Brick Lane, published by Hoxton Mini Press. The images in this book capture life on London's most iconic East End Street during the 1970s and 80s, before the area went through dramatic social change. I mean, you can learn so much of what you need to know about street photography from looking at the pictures in this book. Next up is Philip Lauger de Corsia. Philip Lorca de Corsia uses a combination of daylight and flash to capture people in big city scenes that sometimes border on the artificial. Although the images often look staged, using paid for models that seem out of place, they are not. They are real people in the street. His work has a cinematic feel to it, but exudes a real narrative. His early pictures from the 1970s often featured seemingly mundane family scenes that nonetheless carry an emotional punch through themes of loneliness or dissatisfaction. His work at this time has influenced other photographers such as Alex Soth in their work. A Yale University graduate, de Corsia began his photographic career by finding out what kind of photographer he didn't want to be. He turned away from the fashionable street photography style of the time as personified by photographers such as Lee Friedlander and Gary Winogrand and began shooting in colour, which was starting to be used outside of advertising and more towards fine art photography. De Corsia exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1993. It was his first big solo exhibition and featured his series Hustlers, which featured male prostitutes on Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles, paying them whatever they charged for their services. Following this, he became further immersed in street photography, working on the streets of Los Angeles and New York. In his series Heads from 2000, 
he positioned flash units at particular places on the street and fired them remotely from his carefully positioned camera. He literally made thousands of captures and the pictures are redolent of fine master paintings of old with the stillness of the subject's expressions, perfectly frozen moments in time. Mario Giacomelli is another post-war Italian photographer that I discovered when finding a catalogue of the auctioneer's Christie's, Masterworks of Italian Photography 1945 to 1975, in a second-hand bookshop. Giacomelli turned to photography after the Second World War and at first wandered the streets and fields of his hometown, the seaport of Senegalia, on the Adriatic coast. His gritty and stark contrast photographs were inspired by the films of the great Italian directors Vittorio De Sica and Roberto Rossellini and were discovered by John Sarkovsky of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He started out using a second-hand Cobell rangefinder camera and 6x9 plates and film. He used various photographic techniques in his picture making including double exposure, soft focus and slow shutter speeds for creating blurred movement. Included in his repertoire were a series in an old people's home where his mother worked as a washerwoman. And with his other photographs he produced a very honest series documenting the lives of the poor in southern Italy. Some of my favourites are the unconventional images of the young priests or seminarians relaxing in Senegalia. They produce a strikingly visual effect as their sense of movement, slightly blurred from a slow shutter speed, accentuates their black cassocks which stand out against the white light of the background. A book recommendation would have to be Mario Giacomelli published by Fiden, a huge tome and very good value. In fact there are a few books of his work available at various prices. Lucien Hervé first came to my attention many years ago when I was working on a project to catalogue and microfilm a series of architectural drawings for the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects. I was vaguely aware of the Swiss-French architect Le Corbusier and amongst the drawings I was working with were two relating to his buildings. I forget which ones but I was impressed enough at what I saw to want to see them in photographic form. A trip to the library led me to the discovery of the Hungarian-born photographer Lucien Hervé. Born in 1910, Hervé moved to Paris in 1929, where he undertook various jobs, including photojournalism, before becoming embroiled in the Second World War, being held captive in a German prisoner of war camp. He later escaped and joined the French resistance. It wasn't until 1947 that he was able to start photography again, creating a series of pictures called Paris sans quitter ma fenêtre, translated as Paris without leaving my window. Intriguing, well this caught the attention of Le Corbusier. The starkness of the images, negative spaces and the focus on precise geometric lines certainly caught mine. Already there seemed to be a lean towards the architectural and following this project, Hervé built a collection of some 650 images depicting the Unite d'Habitation building in Marseille, a stark modernist housing project designed by Le Corbusier himself. When Le Corbusier saw them, he was impressed enough to declare Hervé to have the soul of an architect. These pictures mark the start of a collaboration between architect and photographer that lasted for 16 years and which helped to change the way architectural photographs were used to communicate the true nature of a building and its character. Hervé's work included many notable images of Le Corbusier's monumental buildings and those of other architects later in his photographic career. For me, these images sum up the beauty of the light, shade and geometry in an urban setting. Clever compositions, framing and viewpoints result in some wonderfully abstract explorations of modern architectural forms of the time. Hervé's work has had a big influence on me, as you can see in these images particularly when photographing places such as the Barbican in London. Two books worth your attention and your harder money, in my opinion, are Lucien Hervé Building Images and the Photophile book Lucien Hervé, both currently available. Our final photographer, and probably the most well-known of this particular group, is another that devoted his life to street photography. Fred Herzog spent his life walking the streets of his adopted home city of Vancouver, capturing the daily life of the city and its inhabitants. Herzog used a Leica, 
and shot mostly with Kodachrome colour slide film, which contributed hugely to the deeply saturated colours of his images. As we've seen before, this was during a time when fine art photography was closely associated with black and white imagery. Born in Stuttgart in Germany in 1930, Herzog lost both parents during the Second World War. He emigrated to Canada in 1953, where he studied photography. After working as a medical photographer for a local hospital, Herzog became an instructor in the Fine Arts Department at the University of British Columbia. What I like about this is that he developed a walking route through Vancouver that enabled him to become closely acquainted with the daily life on the streets he travelled through. Over the course of several years, he built up a body of work that wonderfully documents the city and its inhabitants during the 1950s and 60s, leaving us with a precious record of those times. Unfortunately, due to the technical difficulties of printing slide film at the time, it wasn't until he was in his late 70s when printing technology had advanced that he was able to showcase his work to a wider audience. Herzog once said, if you don't trust your instincts, and if you don't trust your first vision, then you lose it. There is a terrific book called Fred Herzog Modern Colour that can be easily found. Well, of course, you may already have been acquainted with these great photographers, but a deeper dive into their lives and work proves that they were all masters of their craft, and also that they were dedicated to recording the lives and times on our streets. Thanks for watching. Please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and please let me know what you think in the comments. See you next time. To see my street photography, visit my website at www.rupertvandervelle.co.uk and check out my book, Fine Art Street Photography, from how to use light to what to look for in a scene. Fine Art Street Photography shows you how to turn the urban environment into striking street images. This book is available on Amazon.